This is the S1S Podcast, episode 11. Stage 1 Startup Podcast is launching in T-minus 5 seconds. 3, 2, 1, 0. Prepare for liftoff. Welcome to the Stage 1 Startup Podcast. For startups and aspiring entrepreneurs to find out what it takes to launch any business idea from Stage 1 to success. Now, for your hosts, live from the UK... Nichols and Morley. Hello and welcome to the Stage One Startup Podcast. My name is Greg Nichols. And I'm Brad Morley. And today on the show, we have another amazing guest for you. But before I pass you over to Brad, who's going to give you a brief intro on today's guest, we're going to ask that one time favorite question of ours. Brad, how excited are you right now on a scale of one to 10? I'm on a Motherfucking 19 today. <laughs> Motherfucking 19. Motherfucking 19. Shit, boy. That's a. You must be pretty excited. I am. I'm, I'm pretty excited, but I mean, you seem more <laughs> more pumped, over, than, more pumped than usual. To be fair. So it's a it's a particular niche that I've got a strong interest in. So you do let's have a do strong this, interest. You do have a strong interest in. And if anybody listened to the first episode of Stage One Startup, where both myself and Brad interviewed each other, Brad briefly touched on why today's guest is so important yes. to him. So make sure you go back and check that out. But right now, I'm going to pass you over to Brad, who's going to give you a brief introduction on today's guest. Brad, it's over to you, my friend. Perfect. Thanks, Greg. So in today's episode, guys, we have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Ian Fielding Calcutt, the founder of a million pound tailoring company called Fielding and Nicholson. Ian started the company from scratch and now has over 10 years industry experience. His mantra is that the customer is always right and he strives to go that extra mile every time to ensure that his clients are getting a first-class service. Ian works with a very on-point and creative team of tailoring and stylist consultants who always deliver the best tailoring experience to their customers. See, Ian longed to find a bespoke tailoring company that delivered a contemporary twist on the foundation of a traditional quality and uh, workmanship. So he decided to fill the gap himself back in 2006. Fielding and Nicholson are London-based, but they also have stores in New York and Zurich. They work closely with some of the best British cloth merchants, all of which have access to an extensive range of cloths and offer the finest made in Old English mills in Huddersfield, Yorkshire. Field and Nicholson's consultants work their business around the customer. They visit you in the comfort and the privacy of your office, home or studio, and all your garments are delivered to you and fitted in person. Each customer is allocated their own tailoring consultant who understands you, your tastes and requirements to make sure that you get only the best clothing out there. And they also offer their expert advice on styles and designs that are unique to you. So Ian's next goal is to secure Fielding and Nicholson's status as the only true global luxury visiting tailoring brand. Now, if you aren't impressed right now, then maybe Ian himself can win you over. So Ian, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. Pleased to be here. That's a, it's a pleasure having you with us. Um, interesting topic as well today. I'm excited. Are you, Greg? Yes, one of one of, uh, one of of the topics that's close to Brad's heart, which <laughs> obviously means a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ian, you, we've obviously given a, a brief background on you there, but can you add to that and maybe share with us, you know, a bit about your journey, your background and how you started? Yeah, okay. Well, hello to everyone. Hello to all the listeners. It's uh, great to be on the show. I just want to give you a little bit of background. I won't give you this sort of life story, but I'd just like to tell you how I sort of got into what I do now and uh, just a few kind of little tips here and there and things that have basically made me successful over over the years. It's been a bit of a slog, but I feel like uh, we're getting there. So, um so yeah, I mean, just to cut a bit of a long story short, I um, uh, came out of university, didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, and basically went through a series of jobs from uh, the age of uh, 21 to uh, about the age of 27, so quite a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, It feels like a long time, time when, you're, when you've got that sort of desire burning inside of you to start something of your own, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time. Um, and so I worked in a variety of jobs, really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and then just by chance, I, I worked in a um, an outbound call center, just making uh, calls to for the RAC, to people to renew their breakdown cover. 
And uh, I just happened to really enjoy it. I was really good at it. I didn't really, you know, so it was basically a sales job. Um, mm. And I did very, very well. Uh, I was sort of top of, the, top of the tree, but without really trying and really kind of exerting myself. So I sort of settled on the fact that a career in sales was what I wanted to do. Um, and then basically moved to London again, didn't really have, uh, have a job or a clue of, uh, where I was go- going, but then this sort of, uh, role in PR came up. So it was business development. Um, and that kind of led to sort of the, uh, the role in, um, basically working for a company called Tom James, which is a, a clothing, clothing company, um, which is the, uh, a very large, uh, visiting tailoring organization mm. and basically i got I, I got into that role purely on the fact that it was in clothing which i'd always loved and also it was selling a tangible product mm-hmm. um so yeah so i really enjoyed it did really well so again uh worked there for about three years and um and then i was just extremely successful but a couple of things happened within that company that i was just not happy about and also, I just didn't feel the brand was giving me anything. Like mm-hmm. I didn't feel that I was getting anywhere with that particular brand because the branding was pretty terrible. Yeah, My leadership was really poor. I wasn't getting one-to-one coaching. I, wasn't, I didn't feel like I was moving in the right direction with that company, albeit they'd sort of helped me a lot. Uh, and I just didn't really see a future. So that's when I met my sort of ex-business partner, Adam Nicholson, and he he basically said, "Well, why you know why are you doing this? Why are you working for a company?" And I guess he just sort of gave me the confidence to sort of go out there on my own. Um, so that's that's how it started, and that was yeah around uh, ten years, just over ten years ago. Um, and then yeah, really haven't really looked back. And as uh, I'm sure some of your listeners would appreciate, and you guys as well, um, it's not been an easy path but oh no it's been kind of ups and downs but mostly ups and really really kind of enjoyed the journey it's definitely a roller coaster life of, a, <laughs> <laughs> of an entrepreneur yeah, yeah massively massively so um so, so yeah, I mean, yeah. I it's been great a great journey brilliant so uh, filled in the nicholson being the name obviously you've just answered where the nicholson come from just tell mm. us sort of what happened there um because i take it he's you say x so he's, he's obviously not working with me now well, yeah, I mean, um, I made the mistake and I'd want people to sort of really uh, take heed of this. I went into business 50-50 partnership, um, which obviously sometimes that can be a good way to do it. Um, for me, it really was a bad decision. Uh, at the time, I was quite naive and effectively, you know, 50-50 partnership, you have equal say, but the other person can yeah. over- override you and it was just not a good decision. So, um, and also partially he was there to set up the business rather than to be involved long-term. So oh, fair enough. Mm-hmm. yeah. So after a year, uh, I just came to the decision that I would buy him out. Um, and he was really good about it. He was, he was very, uh, very kind. And mm-hmm. he just said, well, keep the name. You've got a good brand there. Uh, I'm just pay me off X amount. And, uh, it was, it was just a, good decision all around really yeah and i mean do you have any other partners within the business now or is it still you as the co-founder oh sorry as the sole founder of the bit or yeah of the business yeah it's me as the sole owner oh brilliant nice one yeah yeah so it's good it's good i mean um that's the thing the the reason i say that is i've heard a lot of horror stories and i could have been one of those horror stories had i continued because the thing is what the business is worth now um that person who was not really doing what I did. So what I was finding was I was doing the lion's share of the work. And then this other person had a 50% share holding of basically everything that, that I felt that I was, I was creating. So mm. now that's fair enough. Yeah. Me and Brad, yeah. me and Brad are now looking at each other as if to say, <laughs> do not screw me over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing more work than you. Bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, you know, if I guess if one person is contributing yeah. equally to the other, it's fine. It's just, I mean, I know I know partnerships, even in my industry, like Kat and the Dandy is one of them. Mm. Um, the 50-50 partnership, doing really well. But one one of the guys really is really pushing the sort of the sales and marketing. 
and the other guys is kind of running the shop. So it, it, you know, it works really well for them. But for, for me, I mean, this guy, he was an investor, he was an architect, and he wasn't, you know, uh, doing the tailoring, you know, yeah, doing the, the passion, tailoring or selling or anything. There. So, so before well. before we jump into the the uh, the first round of the questions, one um, one qu- one other question that I actually want to ask you about that topic is like, did was the was the other guy that you started the business with? Was he kind of just at the start an investor? Would you say? Did you kind of go into it knowing that you do kind of most of the work? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. he was more of an investor um, slash sort of experienced in business per se. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think a lot of the reason was that it, he was a bit of a. Um, kind of an emotional crutch to lean on because mm. I hadn't got, I didn't have any experience in business. I didn't know anything about accountants, about all the other stuff other than actually the selling part, which is what I was good at. Uh, so I think it was a bit of a, he was a, kind of a bit of a psychological yeah. um, kind of strong rock there yeah. for me at would, the time. Would you use the word mentor at first to kind of just show you the ropes within business? I think, yeah, to an extent. Mm. I think we always felt like more like on a partnership level. So it wasn't really, it never really felt like he was mentoring me from for, for what I do. But yeah, maybe to an extent on the business front, yes. I suppose, like, yeah, like, like you said, obviously you've turned it into a, a great company now. Um, but like like you say, if, you, if you're going to go into the, the 50 50 cut then you need to see you know your returns on on both sides of things not like how you said you you know you're doing most of the work and he's he's getting you know he's he's got he's got the winning goal there because he's getting you know the benefits that both you are receiving but you're doing more more work i suppose where it's slightly different if if you both came to the table with the you know the same sort of ideas and went into it at full front and you know you're doing just as much work as each other but maybe different types of work then it, it works yeah. like you say and it, it certainly works for for us so yeah exactly no, it's, it's good you know, to so hear if, if if you know i was doing all the sales then he was doing all the branding marketing pr you know all that side yeah. of it yeah. and then creating events and setting up partnerships with private members clubs and setting up partnerships with charities and everything else then like you say you know it works it's just sure. that that was just not happening and no. i think looking back um you know i wouldn't blame anyone i think it was you know i was naive to the fact that 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 was going to be the situation yeah. so lesson to be learned i was about to say i hope you're taking yeah. notes of this brad <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna kick you out next week. <laughs> cool. yeah you might want to rewrite that <laughs> cool should we dive in then yes let's dive into the first round of questions do you want to hit it off? Yeah, awesome. So, uh, yes, the one of the main sort of questions that's going to structure this show, um, what sort of made you take the, the tailored route in, in business over everything else? You know, if you had the sales skills, you could have gone out there and done anything you wanted. Um, I know you mentioned there was a, a slight interest in, in the clothing, so far away. T- tell us what made you take the, tailor, the tailoring route. Yeah, I mean, I think since I was a little kid, I, I remember – my friend's father's wearing really nice suits. And I guess that just sort of, it was a resounding memory. So even from a very early age, I love, I just always love the suit and how the suit sort of makes the man, as it were, you know, clothes mm-hmm. make the man, you know, that saying I really believe in. So I've always kind of growing up respected people in very smart clothing. So Mm. when I saw this brand, I was just instantly excited by the whole tailoring side of things just because I felt that um, it was just really sort of well suited to my kind of my interests and my love for, you know, I have a a real interest and love for clothing. So, so that's, so that was one of the key reasons. Um, And then I guess the other one was the fact that, um, obviously I jumped into this company selling this product and I'd been successful at it. So it, it was just very logical for me to then create a business along the same lines mm. rather than going into selling sort of widgets or whatever, you know, because I think a lot of it, when you're setting up a business, um, I'm sure you found this is if you've got a level of experience doing something, then really doing something along those lines is, 
is is the best place to start take advantage of it yeah definitely i suppose especially when you've got a passion for what you're doing as well because it just serves a purpose to the business as well and it kind of you represent at the end of the day you represent the business that you own and if you're not 100 percent passionate about what you're doing then you know nine times out of ten the brand and the business will will probably lose interest yeah yeah exactly i think yeah you've really hit the nail on the head it's the passion it's like when we hire people we used to hire basically cold callers, you know, salespeople, and it and it just it never worked because no. they just didn't did, did not have a passion for clothing, a passion for fashion, a passion yeah. for fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, <laughs> coin a phrase there. But, uh, so they always failed, you know, because that yeah they might be good at selling, um, but we don't want people who are good at selling. We want people who have a, a an interest in clothing and making people look amazing, uh, yeah. and I think that's the difference between what we do as a business and some of our competitors out there fulfillment is the key to success as i say yeah, yeah exactly so i mean the next question i'm about to ask you is is you know where about i mean do you know actually do you actually know how to tailor or are you kind of you know the what's the word i'm looking for like the stylist yeah the stylist the the, the thing that brings it all together yeah no i have to sort of hold my hands up really i don't know <laughs> i don't know how to tailor uh i have really great people around me i have mm-hmm. very experienced tailors several row trained people who are brilliant at tailoring i'm yeah. very good at sort of you know recognizing uh alterations and basically as a, a measurements tailor and, and, and a fitter mm-hmm. but yeah that's my background really so i wouldn't really claim to be a sort of tailor i mean i think you know, these a lot of these guys they train for thirty to forty years. Yeah, yeah master definitely. the art. It's and, a hard um, graft, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. It's really hard. An amazing um, one. I mean, it's sheer strong interest in it. I find it fascinating how someone can uh, can put a piece of cloth and uh, you know turn it into something as amazing as a suit. Mm. Yeah, it really is amazing. And Arketo is he's almost unique because he uh, chalks. And cuts a pattern straight onto the cloth without paper patterns. Jeez, which Jesus, is, it's kind of unheard of. No one really does it. So you're onto uh, one there. Yeah, we're really lucky. We've got he's you know he's amongst the best in in the trade. Really, let's hope we've got no poachers listening. <laughs> <laughs> Close the doors. <laughs> no names. <laughs> okay, and so like, how would you how would you recommend a startup wanting to go into your industry? What is the best way to go about doing it? You know, like what steps should they be taking on a daily basis to kind of get to where you are? So if you could reveal your secrets, that would be brilliant. (laughs) I'm taking, (laughs) obviously, I'm going to hold some of it back. uh, (laughs) Well, I think I would say, I think you need to start with having a skill, maybe having a background. And if you if you do have a background in the industry, obviously, it really helps. So it may be somebody who works in a a tailor's shop or it might be somebody who works for the visiting tailor but it's not doesn't feel like their career is being fulfilled i would say if you could start with uh ideally start with um a great i think i suppose network would be a really key point so if you have an amazing network that is a really key way to 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 be successful at starting mm. this kind of business um and it you know as much of this kind of thing that you actually do currently um i'd say you know if you can then just i mean i'm talking to a chap at the moment who i've been uh, having a few conversations with who is looking to start on his own he's a startup um and you know he's the perfect kind of person because he has background in several different tailoring companies he's already done the visiting thing and he just needs to do it on his own so it's just a bit of tweaking here and there and you know uh, i found personally uh, linkedin is a great source i don't know what you guys find but social media now is obviously we're going to talk about that but definitely uh, yeah we'll come back on that and i think that's uh that's you know a great i think at at the end of the day any startup you've got to sort of go in with the thought that you know it's trial and error isn't it you're not going to get everything right you're going to fail probably a lot during the startup stages you just got to test the waters and, and see what what's really working what doesn't and and sort of learn from your mistakes i guess isn't it yeah exactly Cool. So, um, speaking of that, what what's I wanted to sort of get into was how you know you actually sort of formed. You know, you've you've obviously got a team of outstanding consultants now. Um, 
that work, work alongside you and you know you, you've you've ventured out with with your uh, with your business into different places but could you sort of tell us the the sort of structuring that you went through um when you when you started fielding nicholson because there's obviously a lot of a lot of stuff that people need to think about when starting any business as such but to, to then you know grow into having a, a team of pretty much expert consultants working with you and venturing into different places around the yeah. world it's got to take some serious planning so could you sort of perhaps just touch on the, the structure of what you went through yeah no no i mean i think it i think the starter phase is extremely exciting and i'm sure a lot of your listeners will be feeling that level of excitement um i was extremely excited at the time and so i think for me structure was very very important to begin with so even though you don't really have a job you you have to in some way schedule your day so my day was kind of split into um various the business side of things so i.e setting up the company setting up supplier uh, agreements um you know getting secondary goods sorted that kind of thing of say you know a third of the day and then another you know another aspect would be then the client acquisition so i think um very importantly just scheduling time that you are actually acquiring clients. So I think that was probably the hardest thing. It's just basically staying very, very uh, rigorous to your routine. So saying, saying, right, okay, this next two hours, three hours, I'm going to spend um, calling my clients or calling um, prospects or, you know, and then this hour, say probably the last sort of two, three hours, you're going to spend... Uh, prospecting so I think being uh, very rigid in your routine the more rigid in your routine you can be in, in the early stages the quicker it's gonna it's gonna uh, take off I mean I think probably in the early stages if I'm if I'm really honest was not uh, as as uh, diligent as I could have been um, I think back in the, when I started it was you know, in the days, in the heyday of, uh, you know, the banking world where there was a lot more money to be found and it, things were a lot easier. So I could I could afford to you know, get out of bed at nine or 10 o'clock and, and that, that would be my kind of daily schedule. I just, I wasn't very, um, I didn't really push it too much in the early stages, but that that's just how I started really. Yeah, so can you tell us how long in terms of growth it took for, you know, the business to really kind of take off in the sense of, you know, growth within the company as well as revenue? Well, I mean, I'd say probably the first three years really was finding finding its feet and very growing four years in, we had a big sort of growth spurt after that. And I think partly because I just made had a, made a decision to, to, to sort of fire the business forward, which I really yeah. sort of psychologically, subconsciously, I hadn't, hadn't really made before. So first, at least three years was, uh, was kind of bedding in. It wasn't really going anywhere mm-hmm. for All me, right. but I'm, obviously I don't necessarily recommend that to other people. If they want it, if you wanted to grow it, I would suggest you grow it quicker. But, um, yeah, I was, I was probably a bit sort of slow in the, on the uptake. I think that's actually, I think, was it our last recording or or a couple of episodes ago um we actually got the same you know thing from um two other guys that have founded uh, a web and mobile app development company yeah and it took them three years as well and we were just saying on the show you know it's amazing what what's inspiring to us is that you know after three years you'd think that i mean three years don't get me wrong go, go as quick as hell but yeah exactly it's a long time to be sticking at something and i, I suspect especially if you've got you know people that are close to you that are saying, you know, it's been three years. I don't think it's going to take off now. I mean, was you getting any of that? I was quite lucky. I think I didn't really get a lot of that. I mean, I think the people around me were always supportive. I was lucky, you know, my parents were very supportive of me all along and I didn't really get that sort of people judging me. I think maybe I would say the friends at the time, it was a little bit of a joke because I used to put on my business card, it was like managing director. (laughs) (laughs) they all thought that's always a proud moment though isn't it yeah yeah they all thought that was hilarious because they were like oh you're managing director of what like a you know a few bits of cloth and you know you're working from your flat on your on your ironing board (laughs) (laughs) so i think that 
I think I suppose subconsciously that it was a bit of a knock, but uh, yeah, I mean they were right. You know, I was what well, I was managing, but I had I think I had kind of big dreams that I knew were going to be fulfilled at some point. But yeah, I mean, you've got really to have wasn't. those dreams, though. Don't you? If you don't have them, it's not you're not going to get out of bed every day. Yeah, and I think I think honestly, if you're getting those people who are who do doubt you and do say those kind of things, I think you just need to stop hanging around them because yeah. it's not good. Yeah, circle of influence. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I think I definitely found in recent years hanging around people who are successful, mm. it's really good for you. Mm. Brad is my only yeah. friend at the minute, so. <laughs> <laughs> Cut out a lot of friends for this yeah. show. We did. Help us out. <laughs> I'm sure you've got a teddy as well. <laughs> yes. He's seen, you've seen my teddy on the bed, haven't you? That's what you've done. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, we, we definitely preach that to people, you know, getting around people you aspire to be like, because it definitely helps. Um, and, you know, attending networking events and that, you just get so pumped when you walk away, especially if you, you get yeah. some, you know, potential business connections out of it. So, I mean, going, going back to that, um, you know, you, you've sort of talked us through, you know, leveraging the the uh, the, the skills there and, and really pushing the, the brand and, and creating your team of um, yeah. of consultants. But could you tell us how it sort of works with, because we, we were talking before the show um, that I know you're, you're London based, um, but you know, you, you, you are sort of operating in um, New York and Zurich as well. Can you tell us how that actually sort of works? Yeah. So um, basically we do, we do trips out to uh, Zurich and New York, and we have uh, sort of satellite offices there that we we use sort of just as a like mailing addresses, basically. So we uh, use our connections in London to uh, either refer us or through LinkedIn, we get sort of LinkedIn connections to uh, to Zurich and New York. So we started just making trips out to Zurich mm. as a, as a test market, really, and. Uh, you know, the first couple of trips were very successful. And uh, and then so, and obviously if you do make those trips, then you've got to go back to fit the people. So then mm. we were needing to then sort of continue and book in more uh, new appointments and then and, and sell to people yeah. in, in Zurich. And then, uh, and then so that's now sort of turning over. So every four or five weeks we're in Zurich, which is going really, really well. Uh, Touchwood, and then uh, and then yeah, we started in tandem with that. We started New York, and we started doing New York trips. Uh, we got one guy who's uh, very very good. He's he's been out there now several times, and we've had other people and part uh, other members of the team sort of go out there as well because it's a bit you know it's kind of exciting. It's, it's a good experience like, for people as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a fun trip, and they really enjoy it. And now we're starting to establish a good sort of client footprint in, in, in both markets, which is great. That's yeah. awesome. So, so was there any particular um, reason why you, you picked those two locations or did it just happen to be those two locations that fell into place? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Zurich was um, because obviously the tax reasons and the income of the people there. So we, we did a bit of research about sort of income levels across Europe and Zurich was one of the top so uh, so we so we just picked that one as a as an option and then uh, and obviously then New York is being the kind of financial hub of America um, yeah Wall Street and all that I bet there's some would say the world really <laughs> yeah yeah exactly mm. but if I'm if I'm being completely honest there wasn't a huge amount of like market research that went into it it was just like well, Zurich's a tax free haven, so let's give that a go. And then oh, New York, course. well, it's a financial hub, and there's a load of people mm-hmm. there in banking and loyal. So let's let's give that a go as well. Yeah. So, is, is Milan on the uh, on the cards next? Uh, <laughs> That's some competition, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Not on the foreseeable future. But I think I think as a as a tip for people, I think you can basically go to the nth degree in market research. But I think. Uh, my personal opinion is just not to waste too much time on that because you can get really bogged down in market research and looking at each market and it, you know that can take up all your time and it's yeah. like well, you're actually not you're not actually doing doing the do you know you're not actually kind of getting to your goal which is sort of to make connections in those relevant markets so sometimes personally i think that just just giving places a try and then seeing what happens is is it you know second and see and just see what happens 
Uh, and then if it's really terrible, then obviously you're not going to go there. If it's if it's okay, then mm. give it a go. Yeah. I mean, we've got uh, my brother-in-law lives in Atlanta, and we uh, I was going there to visit him, and I thought, okay, well I'll just try and get some clients there. So I just yeah. did some, you know, keep calling through LinkedIn, and uh, yeah, we got a couple of clients in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. So you know, could, so could, it was just through trying yeah, it, but, trial and error. But yeah, could, yeah. You, could you? I know, obviously, in the in the in, introduction as well we mentioned about how you you know you don't just let people come to you you go to people whether it's in their office home or studio i mean have you ever thought about literally just walking into like one of the main sort of stock broker places in wall street or, or just getting stock some of the broker guys places in? i like the technical term there. <laughs> yeah, sorry <laughs> i can change that <laughs> have you ever sort of thought about you know walking into one of the offices um in the stock exchange market and just you know just going in there and saying guys you know this is who we are, these are business cards, can we maybe show you a bit about us or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think maybe like in the older days, uh, my perception would be that somebody will sort of stop you and kind of say, well, hang on a minute, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it, yeah, I think we have done that, and I definitely I have done that in the past, you know, sort of, I'd say visual prospecting, so I've gone around companies and kind of introduced myself, and I think that but that's a good thing to try because it kind of gets your face out there and people then start kind of um, getting that familiarity. So the only thing is, I think, with the security nowadays, yeah. a lot of these places, it's very hard just to get past the front front line. Um, and, there, you know, there's so much security in these places and, you know, you need security passes and things. So mm. whereas maybe in, in days gone by, it's... You know, I've certainly heard of that, the people walking onto the floor and saying, look, I'm Taylor here, and just getting a whole load of business through doing yeah. that. Yeah, it's it's definitely happened. I think that's, I, you know what, I think that's such a good thing that our, our listeners can really take away from what, you know, Ian's just said, because, you know, it doesn't, you, you don't physically have to do, you know, tons and tons of market research to be able to sort of gain the traction within your business it is literally just a case i believe anyway it is literally just a case of you know going out there seeing what works testing it for yourself and kind of creating your own market re mm. creating your own market research to find out you know what will work with your business because what will work with your business might not work you know for somebody else doing the yeah. exact same thing so you know i think that's a really good bit of advice that you know our listeners can can really take away from i think it can also be a you know, when people are quite scared, very scared of like yeah. making, taking the next step, it's yeah. kind of a comfort zone to just mm -hmm. be on the internet, tapping around and, and sort of looking at different markets and seeing, oh, this might work, this might work. And it can be a bit scary to maybe make that first phone call or send those emails or, you know, do that action. So yeah. sometimes it is just a case of throwing yourself into it and seeing what happens. And it is a case of, you know, people use the internet every single day. And unfortunately, we're in the stage now where the internet's got so big that there's been so many successes on the internet. It goes back to what you just said, you know, people do get scared because rarely do you ever see anything online. Because, uh, I mean, if you were to type in, you know, um, I'm just going to just throw this one out there, how to create a tailoring business, you know, there's going to yeah. be, there's going to be however many search results back and most of them search results are going to look professional. They're going to look the absolute bollocks they're going to look really good and you're going to think to yourself you know what i'm not going to be able to compete with this lot yeah whereas if you just go out there and do it make your name for yourself use the resources that are available to us now like the internet and social media and even offline marketing now is still absolutely huge just go mm. out and do it you know i i just think that sometimes although i'm a huge tech buff the internet <laughs> the internet is uh the internet can be overwhelming it is very overwhelming yeah i think that's definitely the right word yeah and i think it it also should just be a complementary strategy to 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 whatever else you're doing i think sometimes there are people they get obsessed with social media and things and mm. yeah you, you know you may or may not get clients through you know through those avenues but sometimes the more old-fashioned routes work better mm. cool Brilliant. So obviously, I feel like we've asked you quite a lot of personal questions in the sense of like how the business was funded and you know where the, yeah. the where the oranges origin. Ah, uh. you are Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Got to start there. 
<laughs> origins of the uh, of the business came from. But one of the questions that we get asked to ask on the show quite a lot is, you know, how was the business actually funded within the early days? And I mentioned you mentioned in the intro that you had a business partner, but did you seek out investment? Was was you kind of putting the money in yourself? Was the business was your business partner helping out? You know, was you know what are the variables? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. So, I mean, I had some savings to start me off, which mm-hmm. was quite helpful because I was quite successful. So I made quite a, quite a good amount of money beforehand. So I had that. And then basically my business partner matched what I put into the business. Brilliant. Uh, so we kind of joined the, the, the money there. Um, and that was that was it, really. We didn't really have any other funding other than that. And I would recommend, if possible, um, that people do start a business with as little money as as possible. Because mm-hmm. uh, you know there are so many horror stories out there. You know, guys sinking a hundred thousand pounds into a, a business that may or may not work, and it's just like you know. And then they look back and go, "Well, you know, to make that kind of money takes a long time. So mm-hmm. as much you know as you can start the business on a shoestring budget, I would recommend." as much as possible and i know obviously relating back to that um i'm, I'm actually just gonna just gonna relate back to, to a bit of a story just for our listeners that um so, so anyone that's listening we we actually met ian well we didn't actually meet in person but we actually spoke over the internet because going back to our first ever business venture that you know was was very minimal um we was going into the whole knitted tie industry um and you know a lot of you guys in uh, that have viewed our introductory episode would have would have heard this you know when and and literally i remember one day sort of saying to greg you know i, I would love for just some kind of tailoring company to just approach us out of nowhere <laughs> and say you know we like your designs can we have some samples and, and let's do work and i think it was literally within a few days um it was either yourself in or it was someone else at, at your place direct message us on twitter um and said yeah. you know we like your designs can we have some samples and i couldn't believe it i said to greg is this crazy i, I feel like i've just completely manifested it as spoke out to the universe and it's returned but <laughs> but i know you know but in the in, business yeah. exactly and then we obviously met again through uh through stage one startup twitter which i don't even know how happened but again you, you messaged us it must have been fate um and said you know i, yeah. I can help that you guys weird, out isn't, it? We that, isn't, isn't, isn't that weird <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> so when you obviously said that i said oh, well, you've got to come on the show now <laughs> but um, obviously in those stages you know we, we were really young we had minimal funds completely i mean we, we had pretty much nothing really that, that was going for us other than our, our weekend money to go and get pissed up at a pub or, or a club so, but at the time you know going into not knowing about what entrepreneurship is and the technicalities behind it and things you got to think about you know we, we was we was making sales here and there we and there was a few things that come up, but it is overwhelming. And, and I remember at the time we approached, um, I won't obviously say any names, but we approached a manufacturer that was going to actually, we were thinking about getting the designs done because we wanted to go all out and make it, you know, a really professional thing. Um, and they were so happened to be the manufacturer for a top designer brand. I won't say which, but I remember him telling us the pricing and, and we were thinking, you know, fuck, how do we even how do we even go about this? I mean, this will cost so much for the, the things to get made. How do we even get the returns on them? You know, how yeah. much money have we seriously got put into this? And you just don't really know where to start. I mean, mm. could you maybe give any guidance on, on like helpful tips that maybe people can try and use to, to like if they are going through that situation where yeah to overcome those fears. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, th- I would say just in the early stages, not, I would just say don't take too many risks just because you think, you know, you think you should. You find a lot of these, certainly on the clothing front, a lot of guys go out there and they'll, they'll buy thousands and thousands of pounds worth of stock, not necessarily knowing whether it's going to sell. And, it, and sometimes I watch Dragon's Den and see these people and I just think, what the hell are you doing? It's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just mad. So again, I think I'll go back to the other point that I was making before about different, you know, testing different markets. It's just as much as possible, if you can just suck it and see and just, Try little things here and there right before you invest a huge yeah. amount of money or mm-hmm. before you get an investor on board. Because I understand that some people, you know, you might need to have that investment, but you've got to go to them with a very good argument, a very good case, and a very watertight business plan. 
Sure. So if you can do that and say, well, yeah, you know, we've tried this, 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 and this in a small way, and we we've actually established that this is actually a runner, and the likelihood of it working is this, then yeah. uh, then it's you know there's more likely it's, it's gonna it's gonna ride with these guys. They want to see some proof, I guess, sometimes, don't they? Yeah, yeah. But as I say, I just I would say personally, my opinion is just keep the risk as it's probably what you guys thought with the ties it's just like keep the risk as as low as you can yeah. but if you get a lucky break amazing but you don't want to be the one stuck carrying the can if everything fails yeah no definitely <laughs> you know if you if they said like you buy all the stock and you do you know you, you've got to expend like this x amount thousands of pounds it's just no <laughs> you don't need to do that yeah well i think that's good for people to hear and you know i think if we were to do it again now we'd probably you know we'd have a different view on things we'd come and talk to you that's what we did <laughs> yeah. it's a mentoring i love those knitted ties yeah i've still got one have you <laughs> <laughs> i think it's something we, we definitely want to revisit one day so. yeah definitely yeah they're definitely coming back Okay, right, so what we are going to do now, everybody, we're going to go into the five-question rocket round. So for any of our new listeners that don't know what the five-question rocket round is, it's essentially where we ask our guests five quick questions that they have to think on their feet. So normally, you know, we send our we send our guests pre-answer, uh, pre-sort of scheduled questions where they can go through and choose which ones they want and really make themselves feel, make them, you know, feel prepared for the show well this is where they have to jump into the deep end so what we're going to do is we're going to ask ian five questions brad did you want to hit us off with the first question yep. ian are you ready yes i think so <laughs> <laughs> Ian, tapping into your market who's your favorite designer out there that's uh, a big inspiration to you i think that would have to be <laughs> this is this is tough <laughs> i think i would have to say tom ford Tom Ford. Excellent. Nice. I've, uh, I've actually just thought of a question off of the top of my head. When you are at home, are you wearing tracksuit bottoms or a suit? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Because <laughs> I have to wear a suit every single day at work and and I cannot wait to get home and just put a pair of comfy trackies on with a hoodie and yeah. just chill. Yeah, that is my that is what exactly what I'm wearing at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> I can't lie. No, I just at home I just like to chill out and relax and um, yeah, good, tracksuit good. bottoms and a hoodie. Cool. You're not sitting there in a waistcoat or nothing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bespoke hoodie though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dressing gown. Of course, we wouldn't expect anything else. <laughs> um, cool. So, any recommended book for startups? If there was to be one of your own, or if there is one, could you recommend any? Uh, yeah, I would. This is an easy one, actually. I'm sure. I'm not sure you read it. It's called The E Myth by e- Michael Gerber. The E Myth. Yeah, that completely changed my life. That book. I love those books. Where you're reading it and you're going, "This is going to yeah. seriously shape me as a person." I think that, you know, when I said about the whole three years in thing, I think I read that book and it, and ever since I read that book, it, everything changed. Yeah. That's awesome. So who's it by, sorry? Michael Gerber. I'll put those in the show notes. Brilliant. Okay, so next question. Who do you most look up to as an entrepreneurial idol? I would say that would be Richard Branson. I think he's the ultimate yeah entrepreneur. could you just give us a quick you know a couple of reasons as to why well i think he's just got smart working down to a t i watched the i don't know if you saw it the documentary about him on necker island and and it's just amazing the life that he has Sm- smart working it he basically lives on an island in the caribbean and runs all these multiple companies yeah has great life and you know it's he's got a very good sort of balance and work-life balance mm. definitely is. i know one of his tips for his top 10 tips of success is get a get a couch in your kitchen i still don't know why but <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh he is i think he's the ultimate entrepreneur because i think the, the thing is if a lot of people start businesses they get they they become basically slaves to their businesses mm-hmm. and they become these kind of crazy very very hard working technicians who basically all they do is is work 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 um, and I think he proves the fact that he actually can have a quite a nice chill out lifestyle and be extremely successful mm. definitely brilliant so if you could go back to being 22 years old what advice would you give yourself um, I think 
I would say get a really good mentor Mm -hmm. because you like to learn from somebody else who's made all the mistakes is the probably the one biggest thing you can do in your life. And Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky enough at the age of 27 to get a really great mentor in my previous company. You know, it was another thing that really changed my life. Brilliant. I mean, that's one of the one of the answers that we get quite a lot. We haven't actually heard. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Brad. We haven't actually heard any of our guests say, you know, don't get a mentor. I think a mentor no, is absolutely right. key when starting out within, you know, entrepreneurship, business, everything. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, it's like it be training, isn't it? You, you, you're not going to get great results unless you have a really good personal trainer. No, yeah, yeah that's a it, very good example. Everyone used to go on to me about, oh, get a mentor, get a mentor, and I, I just ignored them. Yeah, yeah, because you kind of go through that ignorance, don't you? You don't. Yeah. I don't need anybody else. I can do it on my own. Yeah, yeah, I can do it on my own. I can do it on my own. And, and the minute I got a mentor, suddenly, you know, everything becomes easier. Mm. Perfect. That was a great set of uh, answers and, and questions there in the rocket round. Something different as well. And um, I, I want to actually follow up with that last point actually um about the mentor so where did you find your mentor uh, was it somebody that was in your industry or, or you know was it just somebody that like you said has experience in business and because i know that's a, a big thing that people are always looking for is where to find mentors um yeah and big questions are do they have to be doing the same thing as you or can it just be someone with you know experience that can can pass down a wealth of knowledge Mm. I think it's a really hard one. I mean, I was really lucky because I went to my job interview at my previous company and my mentor was the, one of the people who interviewed me, uh, who was just, I think we just hit it off from day one. We got on really well. Um, and he, he just changed my life completely. Um, from pretty much from the day I met him, I remember him saying, well, he was, he said to me, Oh, how, you know, how are you feeling at the moment? And I said, well, I feel okay. And he said, well, why do you just feel okay? Why don't you feel great? And I was like, well, I just feel, I just feel the way I am. And he's like, well, you know, you can change the way you feel. You can change the way you think. And, uh, and that was, this was all new. It was a massively, yeah. uh, you know, new phenomenon for me. Mm. Um, so he just, he basically instilled in me reading was basically the key to my success. Yeah, I mean, I just I guess I was lucky to get that mentor, but I think you can probably find those people in in you know pretty much any avenue you look. There's mentors who might not be the richest people in the world, but they're mm. rich in terms of their knowledge and like from an yeah. emotional point of view. Mm. Sometimes and, I guess people just look too much into. You know, you could be sitting next to a mentor. You, you know, you you could have someone in your family yeah. that could be a mentor. I suppose. Yeah, people. exactly. It could be a family. It could be could be a friend it could be i mean a lot of these things and also it doesn't necessarily need to cost you a fortune i mean you know there's these companies out there these coaching companies and they charge a ridiculous amount of money to so-called mental people and i mean i had one that i nearly ended up uh, working with and the basically the biggest turnoff i had he he drove up to my house and he had a in a mini and i was like i'm this seriously is like this person is supposed to be te- <laughs> teaching me to become a millionaire, and he's he, he's you know he's <laughs> arriving in a really banged up car. It, it wasn't even a new mini; it was like old, and you know he was late and everything. And, and I just thought, and then he came up with it. Oh, this is and this is how much it's going to cost. And then you sign up for a, a year, and yeah, you know, nice one, mate, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, and I was just you know I would have been bankrupt within a year, uh, within six months even. So yeah. I think it doesn't necessarily have to cost you a fortune and i think a lot of people myself included are quite happy to help people um just because it makes those people feel good Mm. it makes you feel like you're you're actually contributing so it doesn't really make sense to pay for a life coach for somebody to coach you on your life you know it's Mm. it's kind of like one of those things like you just said i don't think i would be able to charge somebody to sit down with them and really help them with their problems and not so much within their personal life because obviously that's on a, that's a complete sort of other level but on a business side on a business side of things you know you want you would want to pass that information down to yeah. the next person and it's a little bit like what we're doing with the stage one startup podcast we want to pass the information down to other people you shouldn't have to charge for it no exactly. at the end of the day, knowledge you know knowledge would you would you say that knowledge is worth money at the end of the day um 
Yeah, I mean, I think... Complete off-topic question, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think knowledge is... I mean, it's like... I don't know if you've ever read that book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's, mm. it, you know, one of the chapters of that. It's like the guy who walks into the, the factory and, he, you know, turns a screw or something. You know, something, there's something going wrong in the factory and he turns his screw and, and, and then that's his job and then he charges $10,000 for it. And, uh, yeah. you know, they're like, hang on a minute. It only took you two minutes. And he's like, well, yeah, but it's the knowledge of knowing what to do mm-hmm. when probably I'm one of the few people in the whole world that actually knows that. So I think I, think, I would say knowledge is worth money and I think coaching is worth money because – if a coach can charge you, say, ten thousand pounds in a year, but you make a hundred thousand in that year, yeah, it's totally worth that, it. Is that worth it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I would say return on investment is definitely, it's definitely worth it if you can justify getting a return. And I would say, I guess, going back to sort of looking for the mentor, I think if you can find someone who's really successful in doing what you want to do, mm-hmm. then seriously that is definitely worth it because time's money and if i could if i could have cut the 10 years it's taken me to get where i am now into three years then sure i would have paid a guy thousands of pounds to to help me Mm. if only uh, if only that coach had turned up in a porsche not a mini (laughs) exactly (laughs) (laughs) brilliant okie dokie that's great. Thank you. Okay, what we're going to do now is we are going to jump into round two of the questions. So round two is where we ask our guests um, all of the technical type of questions that you need to know when starting out in a business. So Brad is going to hit us off with the first question. So this is quite a, a good one for people to know about, especially if they're looking to go into this sort of industry, you know, the traditional industry. Um, so this day and age, Ian, what's your sort of thoughts and opinions on being online? So do you think for somebody that was looking to go into that tailoring industry that they should be getting online with a website and, you know, just generally being online, socially active? Yeah, I think it's essential to have a website. Um, I, but again, going back to the whole cost, return on investment thing you can do that very very cheaply nowadays i'm sure you guys know mm-hmm. um you know through wordpress and things and yeah there's a lot of sharks out there who try and charge you 10 20 000 pounds to create their webs uh, the website i think you can do this very reasonably and even do it yourself nowadays yeah. so i think yeah being online is really important but again try and keep your costs down because um yeah, it depends. It depends what you want because the thing is, for, certainly for our industry, you could go one of two ways. You could go the luxury way, whereas you you have to look the part. You have to have quite a glossy image, or yeah. you could go more the budget way. And and I guess that's the same in a lot of industries. So um, I think just choosing your market is very important when you're building your online presence. Definitely, and you know with. You know, being in a traditional business, you know, which techniques are you currently using to reach out to your market and what are you doing now versus what you were doing at the beginning? So talk us through like the online marketing versus the offline marketing. Was you doing, you know, PR, adverts, cold emailing, cold calling, um, handing out flyers in the street even? Yeah, so I think what we're doing currently is a lot more targeted. So if we do, a, say, a Facebook campaign or a Twitter campaign where we're targeting uh, our sort of end users. So I guess the the key point is that we're uh, we discovered who our kind of client avatar is, as it were, and then we're targeting very closely. So a kind of a, li- a leaflet drop to everyone in the street is 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 a bit irrelevant. So I'd say targeting is key, whether that's mm-hmm. on the phone, which we do a lot of um, every day. So we do a lot of referral calling, LinkedIn calling, uh, some cold calling, although not very much, uh, because that, to me, I just think it's a bit of a scattergun approach. Yeah. Um, as I'm sure you guys agree. Uh, and then, yeah, now we're moving more into the social. So as you can see, we've got towards uh, sort of 9,000 Twitter followers. Now, um, we're getting a, a presence on Facebook, uh, and Instagram, as you know, you were talking about, to me uh, beforehand was is a, is a very key area that we're sort of starting to look so um so yeah i think i think it's just having a strategy that sort of ties in sort of online and offline really mm-hmm. really well 
but don't rely on one or the other. I yeah. Would say. Yeah, use them to kind of intertwine everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's where the sort of old school boys in the sort of tailoring game, I suppose they, they can rely on their, their sort of ongoing customers, but a lot of them probably aren't online, are they? Because, you know, it's still the, the sort of traditional way. I suppose it yeah, probably yeah, works word, for them. Yeah, word of mouth is yeah. still just as as effective, do you think? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, word of mouth is probably the best source of new clients even now that we have. Um but yeah, I mean, a lot of the the old boys are very sort of negative about sort of the new wave of tailors, and they sort of kind of complain and whinge that people aren't walking through their doors. But then they're not, mm, you know. Not then what up. are they actually doing about it? You know, the world's changed since exactly. the nineteen sort of fifties and sixties, and and the people don't necessarily walk along Savile Row and and walk into a tailor shop to get a suit. You know, that's it's not necessarily the same as there's so much choice nowadays, which is not necessarily great for those older more traditional tailors really but they need to again move with the times yeah exactly that's it you got to move with the times things are changing um do you, do you guys still do your conventions um, like the sort yeah. of pop-up pop-up things pop-up events yeah we do yeah here and there we do we do tend to kind of very much cherry pick events that we do so we like we were at the uh, london investors event this year and We'll go to sort of the LCM and um, Pity and that kind of thing, but yeah, we we cherry pick events quite carefully. Yeah. Awesome. So obviously, you started to tell us about you know your your um, your growth is is coming along on Twitter and, and Facebook and that. So we want yeah. to sort of get into the social media side of what works for your business, um, and you, you know, give us a few examples of how effective it's been in terms of bringing customers in and. And really, sort of give us a, a a part of that on the social side. Yeah. So, which platforms are sort of working for you? What are you focusing on? Yeah, we actually we actually get most of our inbound inquiries through. Well, the the primary source is actually an article that was written uh, in the Gentleman's Journal about us and featuring us as one of the top ten tailors in London. Oh wow! Yeah, so we get several we've had several hundred uh, in, inbound inquiries through that um so it's kind of the power of i guess sort of pr slash marketing which mm-hmm. was completely unpaid for though it was a sort of an independent study so that was that's been really good and then we get we got a lot of in, inbound inquiries through twitter actually so twitter is probably our big our big one at the moment and then we just get a lot of interest through through facebook but i think more I would say more direct traffic has come through Twitter. And like with, with Facebook, it's very, Facebook's, I, I don't know about you, but I find Facebook to be quite sort of hard to reach a market because there's no kind of, the only way you can really reach a market on Facebook, I find, is is running ads where you can really yeah. where you can really target things and things like that. I mean, are you I mean obviously you spoke earlier about how to run ads and like how targeting is really kind of precious to a business, but are you doing anything else on Facebook to get your name out there other than ads? I mean, do you go around and kind of join groups or anything like that? Um no, I mean that's one thing we're looking at doing. Um but yeah, we've just been doing sort of the targeted ads. Yeah. We, we've had quite a lot of success through that because, like you say, you can target a certain age range and a certain demographic, which mm-hmm. I think once you know what your target market is, you can very much do that a mm-hmm. lot more confidently. Cool. Brilliant. Okay, so final question before we wrap things up. Can you give us your best bit of advice to a startup right now? Anything that you can think of? That can really benefit our listeners, other than obviously the tons of value that you've given, or <laughs> tons of value that you've given already. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, we talked about the reading. I'd say, I would say, um, I don't know if you've heard of Brendan Burchard. He's yes, quite yeah. big in the sort of social yeah. media. It's, it's His sort of, book, Motivation oh, yeah. Manifesto. Sorry. Oh, that's where I've heard of. Him. It's uh, it's that is that that you spoke earlier about how you know that a book changed your life. That book has changed my life. Yeah, exactly. So, and then, so we've kind of, you know, hitting the, hit the nail on the head in the sense that he, uh, he, something that really struck me, he said that he was really unsuccessful and I think he went bankrupt. And then he said, well, one thing I decided to do was read a, a book every week of the year. 
So he read one book every year, oh, every Jesus. week of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds like an incredible feat, and it, and it is. But the point is, uh, reading is probably the most fundamental thing involved in becoming a successful person. And allied to that, the, you know, self-motivation. Mm-hmm. Just keep, I would just say, keep going to all the listeners. You know, there's going to be times that you will be pulling your hair out. Um, but just keep going because eventually there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And if you do keep going, you're going to be a lot more successful than the 99% of people that Mm -hmm. that fail. (laughs) Yeah. I think just never give up, isn't it? I mean, look at, um, KFC. I mean, I think he was like, I'm sure he was like in his seventies or eighties or something, and he had the worst life. I mean, his journey, the things he went through, and the failures, and the amount of doors that were slammed in his yeah, face. Yeah. He really had. I mean, he really got some absolute shit for a name, but he he, he turned it round and become a billionaire that late in age. So it's never too late. And the chicken is amazing. <laughs> True. <laughs> Finger licking good. Finger licking good. Exactly. Yeah. I have one more question for you, Ian. Mm-hmm. Can you rock? Flip flops with a suit. <laughs> no. Oh man! <laughs> shattered, no, you shattered bit, my dreams. I'm a, bit a traditionalist in that way, <laughs> or uh, you know, the whole bare feet with a suit. Uh huh. Really. What about me if up. you're on like? What about if you're on like holiday, and you've got like a really kind of like a linen suit maybe on, and you're like, you know, you're going to Al Pacino. Or it's not so. Yeah, it's not so like tight. It's not like a. It's not, it's not a tight fitted suit. It's not tailored. It's just you know. Casual. You wear a suit with flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> the cold I hard truth. Go. I need Greg. to leave. I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. We've, it's funny because we've, we've said like a few times, you know, the days we get like when we we always have, have a sort of five to ten minute mo- motivation pump uh, every day where we just sit and chat about things and plans for the future and that and um, every time that we get onto the subject of you know when eventually we we get our own office we get you know employees working um greg greg always says you know i'm, I'm just going to turn up in my white t-shirt pair of shorts and flip-flops <laughs> every day even to meetings and he said you're going to be in a suit still yeah brad's gonna look <laughs> brad's gonna look all dapper and he's gonna look really cool and everyone's gonna really respect him and i'm just gonna sit there with my hoodie on <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's what you need. You no know, good cop, bad cop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Ian, it's been absolutely awesome having you on the show. Um, yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, but we've taken a lot of value from that. Um, I'm sure our listeners have as well. And, you know, it's good to, to hear a change for once. You know, every, a lot of people are focusing on online businesses mm. and online yeah, marketing. And it's good to, mm. you know, hear that the the traditional businesses are still working out there and good at good as good as ever and and that you are you know you can intertwine the the online side of things and and leverage that to to build a platform like you have yeah yeah definitely brilliant okay so can you just for you know for our listeners that want to get in touch with you can you just tell us the best form that oh sorry the best way they can do that yeah so uh probably on twitter would be the best way so it's my consultancy page is called pragmatic penguin brilliant because i love penguins uh, <laughs> who doesn't <laughs> who doesn't i mean how can you not like them that's so cute so yeah my handle is uh pragmatic pengi p-e-n-g-i brilliant and we'll put that in the uh, the show notes for our listeners and we'll also have a section on the website for it as well yeah and where can they find your website and etc about field and nicholson so yeah, that's easy. It's um, fieldingandnicholson.com. Perfect. And then I think just for your listeners, just feel free to. Uh, I mean, there's a there's an email address on the Fielding and Nicholson website. So just feel free to drop me an email with any ideas or thoughts, or if anyone wants any free advice, then just just let me know. Or if anyone wants to get styled up, and I clearly. Greg needs to be styled up a bit. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't got that bad of a style. I got that just bad no, of a just style. no flip flops with suits. And we'll be fine. <laughs> I wish I never said anything. Now. <laughs> I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's not really my thing. Each to their own. Yeah. <laughs> Each to their own. Yeah. Cool. Well, no, yeah, it's been great having you on the show, um, Ian. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and uh, have an great, awesome yeah. day, man.
Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thanks yeah. for coming on the show, Ian. Okay. Cheers. See you later. Thank you for listening to the Stage One Startup Podcast. If you're looking to launch your own business idea, visit stageonestartup.com for recommended resources and step-by-step guidance to help you succeed. Prepare for takeoff.